Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Adriana Locke. Yes, we do. And it is a great show. Um, I love Adriana. She's been doing this for a while and she's so smart. And um, it's, it's a good episode. It's a little bit of a, a deep episode, but mm-hmm. I just think you guys are going to love it. Yeah. She talks about some changes she's made. She's mm-hmm. real honest and open about some like real trauma that she had in her mm-hmm. life and how her her uh, perspective changed yes. because of that and how she structures her life now. Mm-hmm. And um, it's really good. It'll, ha- it'll have you thinking that's for mm-hmm. sure about it what will. you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it will. Yeah. So what's been going on with you, Sarah? Well, um, I'm working on the book, the never ending story. This one I'm beginning to think it is so slow for me right now. <laughs> it's because I've been doing a bunch of other projects. So I'm yeah. ready to get back to writing. Right. So I'm doing that. And, um, That is about, I mean, I have all these other things going on. I have translations going on in the background, Mm -hmm. getting ready to launch one of those. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just, that's like a lot of project management. And actually on that note, I'm going to be doing a um, clubhouse room. Oh, fun. um, Yeah, with Ricardo and Dan, uh, Mm -hmm. Ricardo from Reedsy and Dan Wood from Drafted Digital. And Mm -hmm. it's going to be on um, October 14th, I believe. So I'll put the link in the group if I get that or the date and time. I haven't heard exactly when it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So that's coming up. And um, I was also going to mention, I listened to a podcast today from the creative pen called how to use mystery to hook your readers. And um, it's very interesting because it's not about like specifically about writing mysteries, but it's how to use mystery in all genres. And, Mm. you know, we've talked about like um, leaving open questions or open loops and, it's just very, very good. So if you're mm-hmm. interested, I mean, is a mystery reader. I loved it, but um, right. so I'm going to get that book. He has a book out and I think it's just called mystery. So mm-hmm. um, I think that would be great if you're interested in mystery, just want to pass yep. that along. So that's great. Yeah. So what about you? Um, well, I'm not writing right now. Um, I am doing some admin stuff. I worked on my A plus content. Um, I only I've got two books left to put stuff up. Um, you know, I don't know if it helps or not, but it's available and I may as well use it. So I mm-hmm. did that. I've been doing it. Probably that. can't hurt. It can't hurt. <laughs> it can't hurt. Um, and um, just kind of thinking about, you know what brings me joy in writing and doing that the book's still doing great and um I'm happy with it I'm still happy with you know now I'm getting verified purchase reviews coming in and and people are you know they're not necessarily my people and so they're really liking the book and so that's great um but uh, I did listen to a podcast as well today, actually, the Six Figure Author Podcast, hmm. and Mark Leslie Lefebvre was on it, and the episode is How to Keep from Stressing Out as an Author While Still Achieving Your Goals, and Mark and Joanna have written a book about that, and it was really good, really mm-hmm. uh, some things that I've been thinking about, and um yeah, it was really good. Uh, I'm also still working on my um, 20 books to 50k conference presentation, and uh, so that's yeah, that's going on, kind of mm-hmm. in the background. So that's me. That's what I've been yeah. doing. Well, that sounds great. Well, I think the name of their book is The Relaxed Author. I think it is, is the name Thank of it. You. Yeah, I, I didn't yeah. have that. Right yeah, here, but so it it really it it was just a really great podcast. I mean, yeah. it's just really good. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's a good match for podcast today. The mm-hmm. things that we're talking about, the subject matter. Absolutely. So that's good. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So should we do a question of the week? Yes. Cause we didn't do one last <laughs> week because we're amateurs. Yeah. Uh, we were going so fast. <laughs> we were, we were actually, flying, coming in hot on the uh, intro. Yes, so it could we be were, added. We, to we to actually, the, it was my mistake. I talked about something two weeks in a row and we needed to do a new intro. We and redid like, it. Yeah. At the last hour, we did that intro and we got the question of the week. So yeah. 
fortunately the people who help us out are such pros that it yes, was fine. They are. They're awesome. They're <laughs> so awesome. question of the week this week, um, maybe something about, I really like the phrase Adriana used about branding. She said, sometimes you have to edit your life to achieve mm-hmm. balance. Mm-hmm. So maybe have you, how have you edited your life or how do you want to edit your life to yes. achieve balance? Yes. Maybe. Yeah. Or do you even feel like you need to? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. That's good. Our questions are <laughs> questions are like, look inside my head and see what I'm thinking. That's what our questions are. <laughs> we'll so if you want to answer that one, you yeah. can answer in the Facebook group and let us know what you're thinking. <laughs> yep. All right. Let's get on with the show. All right. Here we go. All right. Today, we're super excited to have Adriana Locke with us. Hi, Adriana. How are you? Good. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. We are excited you're here. We're going to have a great time talking, yeah. I think. So let me read your bio and then we'll get into the questions. USA Today, Washington Post, and Amazon Charts best selling author Adriana Locke lives and breathes books after years of slightly obsessive relationships with the flawed bad boys created by other authors. Adriana has created her own. She resides in the Midwest with her husband, four sons, and two dogs. She spends a large amount of time playing with her kids, drinking coffee, and cooking. You can find her outside if the weather's nice, and there's always a piece of candy in her pocket. Oh Sounds my like gosh, my that's kind the of best. person. Yeah, <laughs> I love candy. Like it's sort of a joke. My husband is like, "Do you ever not have candy?" And I'm like, "No, no. What kind of life would that be?" Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's those little things that make it make a difference. Yeah. Well, tell us how you got into writing. I it was actually a cold and snowy February night, which <laughs> I know sounds like the start of a romance novel. <laughs> uh, but I was actually complaining that I had nothing to read, and my husband had either fortunately or unfortunately seen Arya Mazanville, <laughs> and he knew that that wasn't true. <laughs> and so he, he told me that I should write my own book, and I thought he was kidding because, I mean, I didn't think that I could ever write and finish a novel, but I started it as a joke to him because he dared me, and I don't back down from a dare well. Mm-hmm. And I picked it up and put it down a million times. And Mm -hmm. finally, I hit a moment where I became just obsessed with my characters and which I know now is a normal, a normal thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I ended up with a full novel. With that being said, I just found out in the last few months that my grandmother wrote poetry and no one in my family had thought that that might be interesting to me to know. (laughs) So I like to think that it's in my DNA, but I don't know. (laughs) Oh, that is great. That is great. Now, when was that that you wrote the first novel? I was 33. Mm. And so that was, I just uh, marked my seventh publishing year a couple of weeks ago. Oh, wow. That's great. That's great. So, and then did you publish that book or did you, is that a book under the bed and you started a new one? I actually published it. It's the exception. It was my first novel and, um, I've learned so much with that book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As we all do with that yes. first book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's your definition of success? You know, that has changed so much over my career. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, at one point, certainly it was how many books do I put out in a certain period of time or how much money do I make or did this book outperform the book before it? And certainly some of those things are still goals that I try to achieve in some level, but Success to me truly right now is having a balance in my life. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not just writers. We are marketers and CEOs and sometimes we're wives and mothers and daughters. And we just have so many roles in our lives. And I found through the years that I can't perform well in either side of that if I don't have a balance between the two. And sometimes that means doing a little less on one end or doing a little more, but when both of those sides of my life are in harmony with each other, I am better at both things and I'm happier. And honestly, right now, happiness is truly my barometer of success, I would say. Oh, that's so great. That is such a great answer. Um, And I think that's something that we all want. Yes. So I think during our talk, we'll kind of dig into how you. Yeah, we're going to talk about that that more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft when you started? 
Uh, so many things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I heard, I read this uh, or heard it. Judy Bloom, who is like my goat author, right? Uh-huh. Um, said, or I'm paraphrasing this, but she said, I am not, I am a terrible writer, but I am a great rewriter. Mm-hmm. And when I heard her say that, it was really just like a moment for me. Mm-hmm. Because when I first started writing, I thought I had to have the whole story figured out. I needed to know my characters. I needed to know the dark moment, even though I didn't even know what a dark moment was. Mm-hmm. Um, I needed to know where I was going. And it really gave me paralysis by analysis, to be mm-hmm. honest. Mm-hmm. And I thought that first draft needed to be gold. And now I know that the first draft just teaches you what you're trying to do and you get to rewrite it and actually like make it make sense. And that's fine. That's how it works. And I would have saved myself so much heartache had I just known that beforehand. Right. Right. I always think I can fix this. I can fix this. I can fix this. Yes. (laughs) Or at least I hope I can. But yeah, that's true. And And when you do start trying to make that well, I think they're different personality types. Some personalities, that first draft is pretty much their only draft, except for a few revisions. But I think for a lot of people, you know, that first draft is you is you telling yourself the story mm-hmm. and figuring the things out. And my manuscript always has like red places all the way through it. I changed here, or you know, this needs to be inserted, or they do this here because because I don't want to stop. I want to get to the end. Um, And then I just know that I'll have to fix it when I go back. So I think that's really smart to advice to uh, a lot of people that you can fix it in the rewrite. So that's great. Yeah, that's something that I did not realize for years. And Mm -hmm. I got stuck and I would start and then like what I had on the page wouldn't match up with what I had in my head. What I had on the page was so much worse than what I (laughs) imagined it would be. And so it was very discouraging. But then Mm -hmm. I too kind of came to that point where you're like, oh, okay. I can make it better. So, yeah. So are you a plotter or discovery writer? (laughs) I honestly am both. I I am more of a plotter though. I do like to have, I I usually can pretty pretty much need to plot the first act Mm -hmm. um, and kind of know how I'm getting into that second act. And then I know where I kind of want to get, but I don't necessarily know how I'm going to get there. I kind of have learned to trust the characters to kind of get me where I want to go, but I have to have an idea of where that location may be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that totally. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about marketing? What do you wish you had known about marketing? Um, I mean, so many, I think marketing's the hard part of this mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I wish I would have known, I suppose that marketing takes just as much creativity as the writing itself. Mm -hmm. When I first started, there was this idea, and I think it's really still accepted by many and it, and it still works, you know, for many, I actually follow this to some loose degree every time that I publish a book, but it's that there's this pre-designed way that we must in fact release a book Mm -hmm. you have your cover revealed this early you have your your release blitz is what we're calling it now it used to be called a blog tour Mm -hmm. um and then you go into this group and give things away and you have a party and give more things away and then Mm -hmm. you go to this page and post a giveaway here and Mm -hmm. that's how you do it and i don't think that that is true Mm -hmm. yes those things work i mean we do them for a reason but i think that we get I wish I would have known that it's not to get stuck in that box, Mm -hmm. that there really is more to, you know, to marketing there, there's, there are more options. You just have to kind of get creative with it. Mm -hmm. And another thing I think that is equally important um, as far as that I wish I would have known earlier And that's that you can't expect someone else, whether that be an assistant or a PR company, to market your business or your brand, because really we're brands, right? Mm -hmm. If we don't understand what our brand is first. Right. Oh, that's a very good answer. Yeah. Because it's kind of, you're sending mixed signals to people if you don't know what it is you're marketing to them. And their brand. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Mm -hmm. If I don't know what I am trying to sell and if I don't know what my readers expect of me and if I don't know the things that I do that tells readers what to expect of me, Mm. right? How how can I do any of that well? Yeah. Well, that's great. Such a great answer. I don't think we've had 
that answer before. And it's really, that's really great. Um, what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your author career? And looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Oh, I assume so much. And you know what they say about assumptions. <laughs> yes, <it is. laughs> I think the biggest thing that I, that I, that I did it, that I assumed, and I was really wrong about it was that this is a much more social, um, a social journey than it really is. You know, yeah. you see the authors online and the bloggers and the readers, and they're all having a good time on social media, but really the writing part of what we're doing where we spend most of our time is such a lonely endeavor. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a shock to me to find out. And I think it really has affected me mentally in different ways through the years and trying to find a way to satisfy the need to, you know, talk Mm -hmm. to other people Mm -hmm. and see other people and still be able to write my books. Mm -hmm. Are you more of an extrovert than an introvert? In real life, I'm more of an introvert. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't want to leave my house. I I was known one of my youngest my youngest son. I have four a teenage boys, but when my youngest was a little boy, he was really into baseball. He was on all the travel um, things, and I was known for being the mom that would sit in center field because nobody else would come there. I just wanted, I didn't want to have to talk to anyone, but, you know, when you sit here day after day and you're creating these other worlds, I do crave, you know, a common experience to know mm-hmm. what some, that somebody else is struggling to, or to be able to talk things out with other people. I do. Yeah. I, I definitely am more extroverted in those ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's such a, uh, unusual way to make a living that a lot of the things that we deal with people, other people just don't understand, you mm-hmm. know? like managing the business and then the writing is so different from like what my neighbors do. So right. yeah. Yeah. If you can connect with other writers, that's huge and very helpful, even mm-hmm. for us introverts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Well, and I have to, I have to say things out loud for them to be true. You know, I mean, to, to, and that's, that is super hard for me in particular. That's just always been the struggle with me. Um, too, because it's just hard. It's hard to, and and Zoom is great or, you know, online stuff is good, but I crave, I crave that sitting across from somebody thing, um, looking at their, looking in their eyes sort of thing. So that's hard. That's, but I, um, I agree with you. I hadn't, I I didn't know how lonely it would be sometimes. So I get Mm -hmm. that. Sure. We also like to talk about um, lessons learned and, you know, what uh, what you've learned from things that may have gone right and may have gone wrong. So um, have you ever <laughs> made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Um, the f- biggest thing that comes to mind right offhand is a book that I published called Lucky Number 11. And that was an interesting cross promotion project that I did with five or six other authors. And the idea behind it was that we all wrote our own book that was very trope heavy. And the, I, the idea was that the covers look like magazine, look like magazine covers. And so there was an expose article written about our character and our very trope heavy story was about whatever the headline was. Right. Uh So I had a sports romance and up until this point, my covers had been very um, couple-y, right? Two, mm-hmm. you know, a couple together in some sort of a situation. And for this cover, for the sports romance, I had a set of hot abs and a, a football player with the shirt coming up over his head. And I loved that cover. And I still loved that cover. Mm-hmm. But I released that book and it did not do well. I mean, it did not do well. And the, the reviews were, were solid. It wasn't mm-hmm. necessarily the story. I couldn't figure out what the disconnect was. And I waited about a month and I ended up changing the cover to what it is now. It's a couple sitting, you know, whatever. And my sales after I changed that cover were better than my release. Week. Wow! And I learned immediately about branding. What mm-hmm. do people expect from me when they see Adriana Locke's books? What are they wanting to get? What do they assume they're going to see? How important is it for someone to see a cover and say, oh, that's an Adriana Locke book without ever seeing my name? You certainly couldn't do that with the first cover, but you could with the second. And that was a mistake initially that turned out to teach me something that I've had in my back pocket ever since. Wow. That's that great. Is awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
So yeah. I think branding is one of those things that's kind of, it's hard to put your finger on exactly how to convey your brand. So I know people will be curious besides just having a couple, were there any other elements that you realized, oh, this will help me convey what type of book this is? Or was it just the fact that it was the couples together and not too sportsy romancy? <laughs> Well, yeah, I think that I always say that I can't really sell a sports romance. Um, I have, I can, I, I can't lead with that trope. I'll say that. So I also learned in that, in that mess of a time that I sw- when I switched the cover, I stopped branding it as a sports romance, which I had done for the group project because that was my trope. I started, um, I started marketing at, as a brother's best friend mm-hmm. and I think that also helped. So yeah, there were definitely other things. I rewrote the blurb, things like that to try to appeal to the other, to the other sort of storyline that was present that may have been more appetizing to my readers. Yeah, that's great. And I think that's important for our listeners and especially our newer, newer author listeners that, you know, you're not, you're not, if something's not working, there are things you can do to fix it. You can change the blurb. That's the least expensive thing. You can change the covers. Um, You can try different things uh, to see, but I think it's important that you're doing what Addie said, which is you're you're making sure your brand comes across and um, that way your readers know what to expect. So what, what about the opposite? Have you ever had something you thought this is a brilliant idea, but it turned out to not be so great? I I have these daily (laughs) every day I call my assistant and I'm like oh I had this she's like no we're not (laughs) we've tried this before no I'm not even we're not doing that I have I always say I'll try anything once and Mm -hmm. by this point in my career I think I truly have tried everything once (laughs) um and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't I mean there's just so many examples but I think at the end of the day, you know, if you have one idea that turns out to be brilliant in the, and, and 10 fail, you know, it, it, you still come out as a winner on top and you're never going to learn what works without failing. It goes back to that. You know, I don't know. I'm not a big basketball fan. And I only know this because I saw it on TikTok. Like last week. <laughs> <laughs> but Michael Jordan said there was somebody was saying something about Michael Jordan and how many like three pointers he made over his career or something. And then they showed how many he missed. And I was like, holy cow, but it's the (laughs) same thing. You Mm -hmm. can't, you can't find the brilliance if you don't fail. So you have to, you have to fail just to, you know, to win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is true. That is true. It's uh, you can't make the shots you never shoot. So uh, yes, that that was a simpler way to say that. You're the edited version of my uh, windy story. (laughs) The Cliff Notes version right there. That's right. That's right. So earlier you were talking, when you were talking about success, um, you were saying that's changed over the years. And one of our questions we like to ask is what's the biggest mindset shift that you've had during your career? Um, I've heard you talk a little bit about, about this. So I I think our listeners would really love to hear your perspective on this. You know, I really feel like my biggest mindset change was really to stop comparing not Mm. even my books to other people's books or my, the trajectory of my career to other people's, but also to stop comparing each book of mine to the one before Mm. it's an easy trap to fall in, but it makes no sense in the long run. Mm -hmm. Um, when it comes to like my book to the one before it, you know, I've learned that sometimes a book I've learned to ask myself, what should this book achieve for me? What, what, why am I writing this book? Why should it deserve a spot in my backlog? Mm. And sometimes it's not, you know, certainly sometimes you write a book and you're like, okay, I need that. I want this one to hit. Like, this is the one that, you know, maybe it's a series starter. So that's, Mm. that's your goal for that book. But sometimes, you know, if, if you, maybe you're farther along in a series, or maybe it's what I call marathon money as opposed mm-hmm. to sprint money. Mm-hmm. It's sitting in a spot to make money for me 
for years through a series, right? right? There are so many things to take into consideration when you're releasing. It could be algorithms, how many people are releasing at the time, what people are into, what's going on in the world. You can't expect each book to perform better than the other one. That's just unrealistic. And right. I've learned to let that go and mm-hmm. to take that pressure off myself. But I think even more importantly, I've learned to stop comparing myself. Mm -hmm. I think now I know more of kind of what goes on behind the scenes and what it takes to market and publish a book. And it is not fair for me to look at, say, Jamie's career just because she's we're talking to her. So this is just, you know, and think, oh, well, she's doing these. My book should also be doing these. But that that may not be true. Mm -hmm. Another author may be doing things that I would never do. They may be spending time that I would never take away from my family or money that I would never put into marketing or a gamble that would not be worth the risk for me to take to get to where they are. And so if I knew what was going on behind the scenes, when I'm looking at a book sitting at number one, it's not fair for me to be jealous or upset that maybe my book's not there because I never would have been willing to do the things that it took to get there. And I think it's easy to think, oh, I, you know, I wish... I'm not doing as well as this person, but that's not, that's not the path that my life is on. Mm -hmm. And my, like I said, it goes back to my definition of success. I want to be happy. And when I look at my family and they're happy and I feel fulfilled and my life is in balance, then that's what I'm focusing on. Wow. That's great. That's just such a healthy, healthy way to look at it. Um, Because I also don't, I, do not see you. Um, of course, I don't know what goes on in your head, but I don't see you chasing <laughs> things. Place. Yeah, I just don't think you see you chasing things. Like sometimes I feel like I am chasing things, and I, I admire that a lot uh, about you. That you seem really grounded in um, in your career and what you know your readers like and what you know what you know you can do. And I, I just I have I have always admired that. Um, about you. So I think that's a great answer. Yeah. So another thing you kind of have had a, a, along with pandemic, a tough year, uh, your mom passed away last year from, it was a pretty long battle of, from cancer, right? Yes. My mom passed away from colon cancer a year ago, uh, last week. Yeah. And so how did you, because you still put out books, to, oh, you did put out a book during that time or a couple of them, didn't you? I did. Yeah. yeah. How did you do that? And how has that um, like affected the way you, does that play into the mindset change too? Or uh, I'm just, I just know that we all are wondering how, how to perform continue to do our job when life is just throwing things at us right and left. And I'd love to hear your perspective. Well, I, before my mother even passed away um, in December of 2019, everyone talks about 2020, but for us, it started a month before mm-hmm. our house burned down. Oh, that's right. And I forgot about that. Yes. <laughs> so between December, 2019, And September of 2020, so less than a year's time, Mm -hmm. our house burned down. Um, My car got broken into on Christmas Eve right after our house was burned down. We lost two pets. Mm -hmm. Um, My mother got her colon cancer turned terminal. I had a health condition that forced me to have a surgery that I wasn't expecting. And then COVID happened and we were Mm -hmm. unable to even move because everything was stopped. Mm -hmm. And then like you said, my mother passed away. Mm -hmm. So it's been a very, you know, I think we've all had a lot of trauma this year and I am one of those people that really, you know, had a lot happen, but my mom always taught me to look at the positive. I would call her and be like, my kids are driving me nuts Mm -hmm. or whatever. And she would always tell me you're, you know, things could always be worse. Mm -hmm. And she never sweated the small stuff. You if something broke in our house growing up, or if I was late on a curfew, my Mm -hmm. mom would never, I'm not saying that she didn't care, obviously be more careful. You need to call me if you're going to be late, things like that, but nothing ever, none of the small things ever were a big deal to my mother. She Mm -hmm. was so good about really differentiating between when things were, you know, an emergency and Mm -hmm. when they were not. And I think that I've really kind of carried that through. And I think by the time my mom passed away last year, 
I had um, two books that were supposed to come out Mm -hmm. and I ended up pushing the release back uh, on one of them. I I could have finished it. I mean, I could have sat Mm -hmm. there and done that, but I knew that my heart needed time to sort of, to sort of heal that. And, you know, it, I remember talking this out with my assistant, this writing books, it is a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. This job is a part of who I am. It is not who I am. And when I pass away, I, you know, I held my mom's hand as she, as she passed on. And I remember thinking that as she was laying there, that she wasn't thinking about all of the work that she didn't do. You hear people say that, but it was so real to me in that, in that moment, you know, Mm -hmm. she wasn't worried about the mistakes she made in her business or, you know, how late she was on certain things. She was thinking about me growing up and the conversations that we had in those final few weeks were about, were about the memories when we went to Florida or things my dad said, or picnics that we took to the river or, you know, things that were with our family. It had Mm -hmm. never once did she mention her job. Not once. Yeah. Yeah. And I really kind of carried that out of there and thought, you know, I, I'm in a position where I can financially, you know, push this release mm-hmm. and that's what I need to do. I need to be here with my family right now. It's all about perspective. And I've definitely had a pr- perspective, huge shift in the past year to just sort of letting things go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. I just think that's so great. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's so true. I mean, it's just so true. And it's so hard to see the forest for the trees sometimes. And, and, you know, when your house burns down, your rank really isn't that big of a deal. Or when your mom is so sick, your rank is not that big. You know what I'm saying? It's like, we, we get lost in that sometimes. And I, I just think that's, that's a great perspective that you have. I think, you know, as, as romance writers, we write happily ever after, Yes, but so often we forget our own. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it behooves us to be cognizant of the fact that we are people in every day that goes by, we're writing fictional stories about fictional people, but we are living our own real stories. Mm -hmm. So there's no sense to me in spending more time creating fictional happily ever afters than I spend on my own. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's wonderful. I think that's so true. And I think we do just get wrapped up in like, almost like what we would call the rat race if we Mm -hmm. worked at an office. Mm -hmm. But since we don't, it's, we get wrapped up in rank and promo things and drama too, drama that's going on in the community that maybe, you know, if we're, if I don't know what the latest hobby, like drama thing that's going on, I'm okay. I don't need to know some of this stuff. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) And my life is going to be just fine without it. Exactly. Yeah. So do you have any, um, like practices that you are like habits that you have that help you keep that perspective as time goes by? Do you have any like mantras or anything or how do you um control your thoughts i guess that's a big thing for writers is we're always in our heads and yes i think this is not going to resonate with everyone (laughs) but um when i was really struggling you know through the last year i made a conscious effort to remember who i am because Mm -hmm. i think this this community sometimes tries to tell you who you are or who you're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And I've always been a little headstrong (laughs) and um, I had to remember thanks to my husband, we had a conversation about it and he was like, but you know who you are. You're one of the most like, you know, you've always known who you are when the girls were wearing, you know, crop tops in school, you were wearing basketball shorts. Like you just didn't (laughs) care. And he's like, Mm -hmm. why do you care all of a sudden? And I'm like, you know, I don't know. So my biggest thing is that I, the back, the backdrop of my phone, my wallpaper, I couldn't think of that word (laughs) says, take a deep breath and remember who the F you are. Yes. (laughs) And every time I look at my phone, I see that and it reminds me of who I am. And then I, you know, what's important to me. And that's Mm -hmm. not what anybody says or what anybody else is doing that none of that is who I am none of that matters none of that Mm -hmm. is none of that's in my house you know I know who I am what matters to me and in my kids and that 
that keeps me. And I also have four teenage boys and a husband. So I am the girl I get <laughs> razzed on here all the time. And I, you know, it keeps me very grounded <laughs> in <Yeah>. reality. <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's so good. Um, so what do you think the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success is, has been? I think it's, I think it's being willing, you know, to pivot, mm-hmm. not being married to any idea, any schedule. You know, I, I have a, I have an idea of what I want to do, but I'm not married to it. Right. I'm mm-hmm. willing to switch it if I feel like that's necessary. And I trust my gut. And that's like the biggest thing that I would tell when sometimes my inbox, I'll have someone come I'm starting my, my first novel, or I'm trying to, you know, what advice do you give me? And I'm like, trust your gut. At the end of the day, I really believe that if you trust your gut, that sets you up for success more than anything else, because everything goes back to your heart, right? Mm -hmm. What you want, like, what books do you want to write? What kind of a reader do you want to attract? What kind of marketing strategies do you, are you willing to do? Not everyone wants to do all the bells and whistles. <laughs> but sometimes we get convinced by watching other people and listening to, to, to everything else that we kind of forget to listen to the to our gut. Mm-hmm. And I think that if we lead with that, a lot of things sort of, you know, figure themselves out with less effort from you. You can yeah, overthink right. things less, right? Because we right. all, yeah. I know I overthink everything if I don't watch yeah. it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, me too. That's why I ask if you have any way to like, kind of center your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. And I think it does come back to that, to just like knowing what, what your goals and what makes Mm -hmm. you happy Mm -hmm. and trusting your instincts. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I I mean, it took me a while to learn to do that with my writing. Like sometimes I think, Oh, I think the scene just needs like, you know what it needs or worse. Like when you're editing and you know, it needs to go and you're like, Oh, (laughs) <laughs> but then you have to do yeah. it. Same thing in our normal <laughs> everyday life. We have to kind of apply that too. I think mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's true. We ha- you have to edit your life and you have to not be afraid to remove, to remove things and people and habits. And I mean, I still have a lot of bad habits. I am <laughs> back to drinking Coke again after I stopped. <laughs> it's terrible, but you have to be able to edit your life and, you know, create the, create the life in the, in the business and the brand that, that you want that, that your gut tells you, your heart tells you that you want it. And that doesn't have to reflect anything that's going on. Mm-hmm. It doesn't have to mirror anybody else's anything, you know, make you make your own way. You'll stand out from the crowd that way. Yeah. Right. And then you'll draw the people to you that right. that is like, it's like a magnet. Mm-hmm. You can't help it. Cause they're drawn to that. Cause you're real. So that's yeah. right. That's right. People I'm sense big, that. I'm a big believer in that, that you I read this years ago and I found as the older I get, the more I believe it, that you really attract to what you project. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that is true. <laughs> you want drama? For better or worse. That's yeah. true. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that goes many different ways. Oh, well, well yeah. It's so your, good. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Jamie. I'm sorry. I was just going to say that Addie's the most not low drama person I've ever um, met. So um, I'm going to tell my oldest son that you said that when this is over. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, well, this has been so good. Where yes. can people find out more about you? Oh, I am on all the places except for TikTok. <laughs> okay. I can't understand that platform for the life of me. <laughs> I it's, watch I, it. I, I, I'm not on there either. So I'm with you um, on that. I am. And it's a time suck. And I haven't been on for two weeks. I have I have just sort of stepped back because it was a lot of time. Uh, being yours are out. some of my favorites. When I um, always, when I see yours and I see them on Instagram too, like your reels, I guess. Mm-hmm. I, I always stop what I'm doing and watch it because they. <laughs> I actually showed the one that were, you have the, the mascara, like coming oh, down yeah. your face. Yeah. I made my husband watch that. <laughs> I'm like, this is so, this is gold. And he's like, that is really good. I'm like, I know. He's like, do you know this person? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. So funny. Was funny. The funny thing about that one was I did it, did my face, got it, mud, you know, put the mud on and the mascara and the lipstick, did it and then uploaded it and realized I hadn't put any music with it. And you really need to. 
but I had already cleaned my face up and everything when I realized it. So I took it down, did it again. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, I, I was committed. I was committed. I don't have that much dedication to anything except for like chocolate. You yeah, know? Yeah, me too. Exactly. I hear you on that. I hear you on that. Well, this no, is but I so am fun. everywhere. I really like Instagram. I love Instagram stories. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I have a Facebook group that's so much fun. Um okay. If anybody wants to join us there, it's Books by Adriana Locke. And it's just a great, they're all so nice and they're supportive. And it's really like one of the better things that I've done in my career. Is I feel like we've amassed this group of people and they're so positive And I'm mm-hmm. so proud of that in a random, weird kind of way. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that great. Awesome. That's mm-hmm. great. Well, we'll have all the links in the show notes and those will be at wishidknownthempodcast.com. And um, thanks for listening, everybody. We'll see y'all next week. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.